have 10 acres and about uh, three to four in production at any one time. We have extensive cover cropping uh, rotation. We market almost all of our uh, vegetables through a community supported agriculture program. There's 100 families that support this farm. We've been certified organic for going on, gosh, almost 10 years now. Really, it's uh, the first time that there's been some baseline data of pollinators taken in the state, especially on diverse horticultural farms. So you're kind of uh, participating in uh, groundbreaking um, uh, sets of information. And when we think about insects providing ecological services, everybody immediately jumps to pollinators. Okay, so that's what we're talking about something that the insects will do for us as a service to our uh, use of nature. So pollination is one of those, but there are others as well. And one that insects really don't get enough credit for is being recyclers. If it weren't for insects, we would be up to our armpits in dead animals and dead plant material. That insects are breaking that down, and that's one of the benefits that we have of, of insects as well. So. We have that benefit, and we also know that insects are predators and parasitoids, and that's another benefit that we get from insects that they just do for us. Lady beetles eating aphids, the little tiny wasps that live inside the, the uh, other insect pests. Well, Small Potatoes Farm was one of the places that about uh, six years ago, participated in one of the first studies of this ecological services role and what can we do to make it a little better. And that's the poster that's back there on the wall. You're welcome to read that. That looked at all beneficial insects, not just pollinators, where if we planted a diversity of flowering plants in the little yellow boxes around the edge, and standing here, that little yellow box on the map is that planting of cup plant over there. If we did something like that, would it help? Well, here we are six or seven years later, we still don't know. We think <coughs> we're helping, but what we've also discovered is that there's a continuum of what's already there. That if you lived in the desert and there were no insects to provide ecological services, it wouldn't matter how much you planted, they still wouldn't be there. If you live in a very diverse uh, landscape at the other end of that extreme, they're already there, they're already taken care of, planting more isn't going to help. In fact, it may detract from what they're already doing. But most of us are going to be somewhere in the middle of this continuum between none and too many, and there might be things we can do to help that along. But we're still collecting that data, we're still trying to figure that out. So while that study looked at all beneficial insects, the next study, the one that's the subject of the handout that you could pick up inside, looked at just pollinators. And because that's a huge topic, it was narrowed down to pollinators of melons and squash. And because that's still a huge topic, it's just melons and squash in Iowa. All right, so we had to narrow it down to, to look at it. And one of the things we find is there are, there's a little confusion about which kind of insect it is. And so the first part of this chart talks about what is the difference between a bee, a wasp, and a fly. Probably you think you know, but I'll bet you are easily fooled from time to time that you look at something that you think is a bee when actually it's one of these flies that looks like a bee. The other thing that's required topic, anytime an entomologist shows up and talks, about, talks to a crowd, they're going to mention life cycle. How do they grow? How do they develop? And bees, wasps, and flies all have a complete life cycle. Four stages of growth, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. That life cycle is critical 
to understand in order to figure out what's going on where are the eggs where are the larvae we're looking at the adult stage but how did we get to that point so that's why we always talk about the life cycle and then there's a little picture of a bee larva there to remind us that we're not talking about caterpillars we're not talking about maggots we're talking about these wrinkly little grub like things that have a little tiny head no legs can't get around on their own. They're not going to be crawling out around on the ground. They're going to be in the nest. When we talk about pollinators, we have two kinds of bees. The last two on that sheet are the social bees that make a hive. They make a colony. They have a queen who reproduces. Her daughters do the work for her. And they have this division of labor. They have overlapping generations. And you probably know about those. The social bees, the honeybees, and the bumblebees. The ones that have been the focus of our research more late, recently are these solitary bees. They're solitary in that each female does her own work. She makes her own nest, she gathers her own food, she raises her own offspring, what little maternal care there might be, and then she dies fairly quickly and that colony disappears, that little nest that she created. And there are several of those solitary bees that have turned out to be much more abundant, much more diverse, and much more important than we believed. In the two years that this study was going on, we collected over a thousand bees from eight different farms. All the bees that were collected at small potato farms in two years are in the building there for you to look at. And you can pick out these different groups. The, the one that uh, turns out important for squash is the squash bee, oddly enough. Then there are these things called long-horned bees, which just are bees with long antennae. And then three different kinds of sweat bees. On this farm, about uh, 42 different species of bees were collected. It's a little overwhelming to see that there are that many species out there and to know them, but you very quickly look at the links of the bars and you see who's out there the most. Mel, uh, the first long line is Melisodes bimaculata. That is a big black bee. Okay? Very, very abundant all over the state. A generalist that feeds on pollen and nectar from everything. It's very common in soybean fields even. The next uh, big line is um, Agapostenum virescens. That's one of the little sweat bees. Okay? That the lines in between, like Halictus and Leptioglossum, those are also uh, in the sweat bee group. What didn't show up in the bowl, but shows up in the bee vac as the most important, is this uh, Pepinasis, the first big line, that is the squash bee.